How's everyone doing? Is everyone good? Sweet. <laughs> all right, let's get started. Um, all right, is everyone good online? All right. I'll assume that's a yes. All right, so um, since I forgot to introduce myself again, I'm Tasha Snow. I'm a research associate at the Colorado School of Mines. So I'm gonna chat now with you about what CryoCloud is. It's not even on. Um, so I talked to you, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday, what, what is open science? Um, NASA has said that science done in a more fundamentally open way, way is the way of the future. And um, that description, that definition is something that you saw yesterday. You also heard about the Open Source Science Initiative and the Transform to Open Science program that NASA is pushing to make um, science more transparent, inclusive, accessible, and reproducible. And so we uh, at CrowdCloud kind of came out um, from this uh, funding call and um, are pushing a lot of this forward using cloud computing. And so that's all going to be, um, we're, we're bringing a lot of people in the cloud cloud as part of this year of open science. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, the cloud is this collaborative reproducible um, open science place to do all of these, uh, these things. Uh, I mentioned what the cloud is. This is all in the internet where your data and your servers are. Um, and, it's really, the cloud is creating this digital watering hole where our data is this um, substance that everyone needs to use, depend, no matter what sort of field you're in, everyone needs to access the data, but it can no longer be um, held on your computer. So, um, so we're using the cloud to keep the data up um, accessible to everybody. We can put our servers and our tools in the same location and um, build those tools in a way that we need them to be built. And it allows us to access the big data, disparate data, um, allow participation of diverse communities and to ultimately connect with society and impact critical decision-making on timescales that can be much faster than they used to be because we can access the data really quickly. So um, let's talk about the concepts and skills um, for using this tool as um, a way of creating thought and making reproducible and open science. So some of the practical skills that um, we can, that are useful for open science, um, we have version control in CryoCloud. We can use Git and GitHub programming. We can use something like Python that's open, uh, process automation. We can do data analysis, software testing, documentation and publishing, continuous integration and reproducible containers. Um, so the Jupyter book is one way that um, places, groups like uh, AGU are starting to really test for using um, as a means for publishing. So you can create um, a lot of text. You can put all of your figures and everything in testable code into a Jupyter notebook, someone can run it, and that makes it completely reproducible and transparent. So anyone can get onto the internet and access it. Um, so this is this is one of the new ways of the future for, for publishing. And what you can add to one of those repositories where you have that Jupyter book is um, a my, my binder button. So you can see that right here at the bottom. Um, this is basically where you create an environment in the cloud People can push that button, they open up your code, and they can immediately use it. They don't have to install anything. It makes it completely um, interactive and, and reproducible. And so some of this has been tested in the STAT 159 course run by Fernando Perez, who is a faculty member at Berkeley and co-founder of Jupyter and also one of the collaborators on this project. Um, he runs this course every year where during the course of a semester, he teaches everyone in the cloud 
they are by the end of the semester they've created a jupiter book based on whatever project they wanted scientific work they wanted to do there's a main paper as part of it there's supporting analysis um, notebooks there's code and tests for all of it and then there's the binder um, link so that it's all reproducible and so these are examples of some of the studies that have been done um, in that data science course so exploring air quality and also uh, studying breast cancer. And what's really cool about the cloud and using this as an educational tool is that you can actually teach 50 to 2,000 students in the cloud for one to $2 per semester per student, which is crazy. They're, so it's super, it's super um, cost effective as long as the infrastructure is built in a way that um, reduces costs, which is what the CryoCloud is. We've done this with Jupyter Hub um, that's been built for you guys. If you were to do this on your own without all the background information, it would be very challenging to create numbers like this because we actually built CryoCloud um, for partially this, this reason where people were racking up dollar, like a lot of costs without realizing it, which I'll talk about in just a second. So we have these new spaces and we need organizational models um, for working in the cloud. So as I was just mentioning what CryoCloud kind of came out of, um, the ISAT 2 science team meeting is a meeting where um, the science team that kind of runs the mission for ISAT 2, ISAT 2 is um, a laser altimeter that is um, owned by NASA and yeah, the science team runs that mission. They meet twice a year. In May last year, myself and Joanna Milstein, who is the other lead on this project, um, were sitting in on an open science cloud panel where people talked about the issues that they had with the cloud. And some of those issues are shown here. They said that there was non-intuitive pricing structures, computing options and infrastructure documentation was poor. It was costly to use took time to transition their workflows. There were worries around intellectual theft and it wasn't obviously more collaborative or faster. And that may be some of the worries that you guys have, um, but our mine and Joanna's uh, experience in the cloud was very different than this. And part of the reason why is because we worked with 2I2C. So 2I2C is the Inter International Interactive Computing Collaboration. They're a nonprofit who provide interactive computing um, environments for, um, for whoever purchases it. So they're a service provider of it. And they build these, their mission is for um, making these as cheap and um, useful as possible for education and research. And this was born out of three different institutions, um, Pangeo, UBC, uh, University of British Columbia and Berkeley all creating these kinds of Jupiter hubs and then being catastrophically successful. They built these, everyone wanted them, but as institutions, they're not able to provide them. So they founded um, 2I2C instead. And so 2I2C provides these services now for everybody. And so working with 2I2C, um, they their goal is to contribute back to the open source community. A lot of them are uh, people who have built some of the Jupyter infrastructure that everybody uses. Um, they also have these, um, these goals of having, uh, having no vendor lock-in and community empowerment. So they um, stand by the right to replicate. All of their infrastructure can be taken to any other um, vendors or you can take it yourself and, and rebuild it yourself. All of the code that you have is, is in the background and you, you can use it yourself. And they have a shared responsibility model where um, they will allow you to participate as much as you want at first, and they will teach you along the way so that you can help to develop skills working in the cloud to stand up and maintain your own infrastructure um, after some time, some parts of the infrastructure and only in the places that you're really interested. So it's a really cool organization to work with. And I've been learning a ton working with them. Um, so knowing how 2I2C functions, after going to that ISET2 science team meeting, we decided to build CrowdCloud, uh, which is a cloud computing platform with bumpers. 
So it was meant to be a simple and cost-effective cloud-managed environment, as I mentioned yesterday, um, for training and transitioning new users to cloud workflows, and we want to uh, create uh, community best practices. And so it's built for CrowdSphere scientists by cloud engineers to be able to process data faster, democratize science, work more collaboratively. As I mentioned yesterday, it's gonna be persistent for at least three years, hopefully longer if we show it successful. Um, as you'll see in a few moments, you um, everyone has access to small servers, which are um, shared. You can get anything um, from one to 32 gigabytes that are yours alone. And um, the servers are actually 32 gigabytes. So they're, um, I'll, I'll show you in a moment what that means. Um, but basically all users have access to that. And then you can have larger servers built for you if um, you bring your own cloud credits. We are creating new tools within this project. One of them is a cost monitoring tool. So you can understand your usage and how much you're charging up while you're using the cloud. That's currently not available on Jupyter, but eventually it will be a button on the Jupyter Hub um, that is, and this will be something that goes into Jupyter Hub for everybody, not just um, our community. And we're also trying to create improved intra and inter hub tools if you're using multiple hubs. Um, how do those hubs communicate better? All these tools are being developed under this project. And along, uh, along with that, we are working with 2I2C to help them scale up because they're a new nonprofit by providing community surveys, feedback, and guidance. And so what we end up getting is a hub that has custom environments, online content, cloud infrastructure, and the support and services we need. And all it takes to authenticate and access it is for us to have your um, GitHub user ID. We add it into our GitHub um, organization. As you've seen, you, you get invited um, to our organization and then you immediately have access. So all it requires is your GitHub user ID and password to get into um, CryoCloud. And so this creates a unified experience for research computing that looks very similar between your laptop, your cloud computing environment, your HPC environment, all of these should look very similar. Um, so this is the cloud hosted installation, and this is what it'll look like when we open it up. This is the, the Jupyter Hub. It looks just like Jupyter Lab, and it includes Jupyter Notebooks. So whichever of those you're familiar with, um, you should be able to recognize that. How many people have used Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab before? Most people? Cool. Awesome. We also have our studio and MATLAB um, if you want to use those. So, um, so those are going to be accessible. And um, it's it has Jupyter Lab has all, everyone's going to be able to access Jupyter Lab basically when they open up the um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, they might have asked if it's the same because I've never used Jupyter Lab or anything like that. Uh -huh. So, what's the difference between Jupyter Lab or notebook? I mean, I don't want you to take too much. Time. Oh, yeah. No, I can explain it very quickly. So, Jupyter Notebooks is the oldest version. Um, it's basically just this, uh, like, one notebook with code that has a bunch of different cells in it. It works very similar to, like, if you have an RStudio script, it's basically your script is the notebook. Lab provides these other kinds of um, tools that include like fi file folders um, that you can see. It allows you to open Markdown, uh, open multiple books, uh, notebooks at the same time. You can view them side by side. And this is on your local computer. And then Jupyter Hub is in the cloud. So it's pretty much the same thing. But um, now you have shared folders with other groups for other people that are on your hub. Um, there's cloud access, that sort of thing. So within Jupyter Lab, we also we have the full terminal window that we can have. We have file management. You have markdown. You can do preview um, here, or you can do editing. Um, I just want to correct you. We have a launcher that'll have all the tools. You see this, you'll see this in just a moment. 
There's viewers for CSV. You can edit the view the CSV separately. There's different kinds of um, image uh, geojson JSON uh, visualizations that you can use that are automatic. And you can do normal computing in them as well. There's a virtual desktop. It's a Linux desktop. And in that, we have uh, Qt Greenland, which um, you can open up through QGIS. And we have file synchronization um, tools called SyncThing, which is very similar to Dropbox. It'll allow you to sync between your local computer, um, the, the cloud, and um, like you can share with other people as well, just like you would be able to with Dropbox. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the option for having multi different images. So this right now is just our MATLAB and Python. All of them just open up in a Jupyter hub, um, but then you can push a button and get to those specific um, programs. And eventually that may mean we also have different environments. So we can have like a machine learning environment because that's going to be very big and not many people need to use it and have our separate like image processing uh, environment that we kind of have going right now or cryosphere like general image. Um, so there is some versatility in that. Right now we just have one image for Python. Um, node sharing looks a little bit like this. Um, as you'll notice in a, a few minutes, basically a small server means you're opening up a server that has 32 gigabytes of, of met local memory and four CPUs. But in order to make this more cost effective, we can share with other people who are in our cloud and use less of the, um, the memory that's on our own. And so what these numbers are, are a guaranteed number. So you get one gigabyte of memory up to 32, depending on who you're sharing with or if you are sharing with somebody. If you choose eight, then you get minimum eight, maximum 32. So that's what that, those numbers mean when you open those up. And having multiple CPUs allows you to do parallelized work eventually, um, that sort of thing. So you get, the, you get those kinds of um, added benefits. Yeah. Is there any plans for GPU resources? Uh, there can be. Yeah. So GPU resources are pretty expensive. So um, we can talk about, uh, we're, we have a certain number of cloud credits at the moment, and we are interested to know what how much people end up needing um, eventually, and we can apply for more cloud credits. People can also bring their own. So the GPUs will require more. Um, this is with AWS. This is with AWS, yeah. Um, and so what ends up coming out of this is you get something like this. This is a notebook that we ran um, with Landsat data. It's got ISAT2, Landsat, and Modis data that you open up into it all in one place. And it's coming straight out of the cloud streaming. And we're also using tools like X-Array, IcePix is the ISAT2 um, tool, Earth Access is the NASA tool, all of those things in one notebook. And not only that, we are pushing, like these are all being developed right now. We are kind of pushing those to their limits, testing those. The developers of the of those packages are also working in our in our cloud or similar clouds. And what that allows us to do is having all these different kinds of users. It accelerates feedback and collaboration and allows these tools to be developed for our exact needs. So when you have problems that come up, you can let people know, and then those tools get fixed. And if you need something that isn't being provided by that tool, we can those things can get added to these um, ice picks or earth access to make sure that you guys are able to do the things that you need to do, like when you have issues. And what that means is like we're actively participating in making sure that these tools are developed for our needs and we can do the things that we need to. So let's take CrowdCloud for a test drive. Um, I'm going to exit out of this. Yeah. It's an environment.yaml. We, um, we would want to create a separate image for you. 
Um, and that would just be added to our image selector. But so that has to be done like through the control. Yeah. I mean, you can, it's, you can, you can add your own image and we can then, you can just tell us and we can deploy it or I can help you, you do it depending on um, it, if you've done it before. My other question is if we wanted to use this for teaching, right? So now we want 30 students who each have their own account and then work on it. Is, is this not the right use case or because actually something that a few of us have talked about before is um, just having more like set resources for teaching let's say off of a duplicate notebook and then being able to collaborate and like the free like binder for example is not really optimized for that sort of thing yeah um do you see that as being a use case for this so i think that is something we haven't that that's a bridge we haven't crossed yet um this is meant mostly to be for trading and, and everyday research at the moment um but i can see us potentially doing that. Um, we just haven't, like, we haven't decided to do that. I haven't gotten permission from 2I2C to do that um, as our collaborators. Most people don't have to ask that question. Um, but uh, yeah, with, with our team, we would discuss if we're ready to do that. That might be, that might be something we can't do in the first year, just because we're doing a lot of onboard, onboarding for our researchers. But um, we are allowing groups like Hack Weeks to come on. Um, we're doing the Q Greenland workshop. We're um, doing SnowX, ISAT2 Hack Weeks, um, and then supporting FOGS, WASTE, and AGU. And so this is an ideal place to be able to do that sort of thing. If you can bring your own cloud credits to kind of supplement what we have already, like the infrastructure takes a certain amount of money to keep going, and then the cloud credits are on top of that. And so we save you guys a bunch of money doing that. And it's a good way to test like what you end up needing, what our community ends up needing. So I can foresee us doing that. Um, we would just have to have a conversation when the time comes a bit ahead of time. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna say on the chat thing, can you repeat whatever asking the question you're speaking? Oh yeah. <laughs> Alex asked if, um, if it can be, if the crowd cloud can be used for teaching a course. And I said, potentially with conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I guess it's not directly sort of a similar vein question. So I'll ask it now. Is what, what is the, what is the thinking about, I, so I, I sort of see this as we, we have all these investigators that want to research in the cloud and they're going to have to make those for like educate them in getting this going. But what happens when the, the each of those people gets facile in this environment and wants to start scaling out? Have you thought about the offboarding problem? It's going to be onboarding problem where the, the NASA needs to articulate the trajectory here. I don't know how need, you know, I need to need a hundred cores and I need a terabyte, you know, terabyte of data in the cloud because I've learned how to do this here, but I can't scale. You should you should be able to scale here. Well it's, but does that mean that that what I need to do is ask NASA for credits and bring it to you and my research is always in your environment? Or because there's you know you we how to use the cloud to do could just scale instantly on the weekend when you're thinking about it. Say you could come back and when you're if you become the free computer support for all of NASA's researchers. Oh know, yeah, it won't be for all of NASA's researchers. So so that no, but I mean that's there you need to step out into the cloud and run big jobs. Yeah. And and so I, I guess I just would encourage that conversation at the same time that you're thinking about how to, to scale the learning side of it is what is the trajectory out to do the research afterward? Because NASA's still figuring that out, right? They have they, yeah, absolutely. As far as I can tell, I have no idea how to get funded to do $500,000 worth of the cloud exactly. Yeah. So, so Mark's question was, um, how how are we thinking about offboarding if people need to scale and do, say, large amounts of compute um, off of CryoCloud? Um, so my answer is I'm not sure that you need to off to to get off of um crowd cloud because i mean we can scale gpus as large as is possible with aws and we can provide those to 
only the users who need them. Um, and you can bring your own cloud credits, right? If the, it's a function of like just being able to figure out how we get the cloud credits, whether I submit a proposal to AWS and we get $100,000 of cloud, cloud credits that way, or if we ask NASA for it, that's um, that we have to figure out. Um, but we can get large servers as people, if people really want to, to do that. Um, it's it's going to be much larger than the eleven thousand dollars of crowd, crowd credits that I have per year right now. Yeah. Um, but ideally, we can scale, and if we can't, then all the infrastructure is portable. Ideally, though, I mean, it costs a certain amount to keep this going. So if we provide this as a service, where this baseline cloud environment, Jupiter Hub, is stood up by like the Jupiter like developers. So this is like state of the art. Even the people who are going to run it from a different professional organization are not going to have the expertise that the people standing at this hub have because we have like the co-founder working on it. So ideally we can do this here, but if we yeah. can't, that's something we need to learn. Well, it's, and, and it, it, my question is probably actually really shallow. Um, this is a bit of that, but the, it, it, it's really the cloud credits, right? The answer is the cloud credits, because if, if you actually have the cloud credits, you can go and do the stuff in the cloud outside of this environment. You can bring your own container, yeah. and run your own jobs and scale it, but you need to pull in the process. So, I mean, it, it isn't necessary. I'm just saying it's not necessary to keep the research in this environment. Correct. That's, that's yeah, people can move out of it. Um... There's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, the infrastructure working with AWS um, is really hard. Uh, it's not intuitive. They make it very hard. They make it very easy to spend lots of money without meaning to. So yeah. Yeah, and Caitlin. I just want to add a little bit of context and correct me if I'm wrong, Tasha. So Trial, Trial Cloud was not meant to be this platform where you can do your science forever. It was born out of people's concerns about how to start using cloud computing in your science. So it was meant to just be this, this springboard for you to then take the skills that you learn while you're using this tool to then go and write your own proposals, get your own funding to get your own credits, server access to do your own science. So that, does, does that help? With, I do understand that they should be maybe helping people kind of offboard onto larger projects. But I don't think that this was meant to be scaled up in, per in perpetuity to allow people to continue doing massive projects with this system. We made it flexible so you can. Um, but I mean, it, you're correct. Uh, the, the, base, the base use that we have, the servers that we're providing only allow you to do your, your normal research on them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've... Uh, we've allowed the the ability to be flexible on that and part of it is learning what our community needs and how uh how we work with people within a community within an umbrella underneath nasa like we're each a village each each field that might be using the cloud computing we we each sit, sit under these umbrellas how do they communicate with each other um all of that requires us working and like figuring out like where we're pushing the boundaries. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so if you go to hub.cryonthecloud.com, um, is everyone there and able to see this? Have you, you can click on cryonthecloud.com, you push a button that says, uh, I forget what the button is. Login, Login maybe. Uh, it, it says open the hub or it's a red button right underneath the cloud. Uh, CryOnTheCloud.com. If you're one of those people who didn't spill out the survey ahead of time, can you still gain it? Oh, yeah. Wilson, do you have that? I just see one. So if you submitted late, um, you'll receive a, an invitation to get our GitHub organization. You have to accept that and then you'll be able to access the cloud. So the uh, original page will be 
a, a crowd called logo with the red button underneath it. And that's the red button you need to click to get to here. And then it'll ask for your GitHub user name and um, password. All right, is there anyone else who needs any help? Yeah. All right, how many people are not quite on here? Okay. Hub.bio and the cloud.com. So you have you logged in? So say instead of go to that website, you can log me in. So you probably logged in earlier? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but you're already set. All right, I'm gonna keep going. We'll have a few minutes after this for us to work on this um, for each of you that's not quite on it yet. Um, we'll have plenty of time. Uh, so for everyone else, for everyone, you can just watch here. So you can choose which image that you want here. Python or MATLAB. If you choose the MATLAB kernel, just know you're going to have to bring your own um, license from your, your institution. So um, this is how we make this open source kind of without leaving people behind is that um, we provide the infrastructure for accessing MATLAB. Everyone who uses MATLAB, like the ISSM modelers, that sort of thing can, can access it in the cloud, um, but uh, we don't provide the license itself. And then R is um, available as well. We'll go with Python. We'll just do one gigabyte um, CPU. So, um, you mentioned ISSM, is ISSM built in the image? Um, no, there's some sort of, there's something, I think Dennis added it. There's something from ISSM that's in our public, our shared folder. I saw that, yeah. Um, but the rest isn't built. I'm not sure what's been done on that okay. front. That's what you guys are doing. Maybe the ISSM might do it. Yeah. We're here to like help people bring whatever they need into it. Oops. All right, so once that bar finishes, you should have something that looks just like this. All right, so this is a terminal window. This works just like um, your terminal on your computer. This is your command line. Um, home slash Jovian is like our home folders that you actually don't see here. So that's important to know when you're thinking about paths to your files. Um, home slash Jov Jovian, which is like, Jovian is the word right here. That That's gonna come between before all of your folders. 
If something doesn't isn't accessible, that's because you're missing that in your path. Um, when you look at the uh, Jupyter Hub, you have your your um, all of your files there on the on the left there, and um, these are your personalized ones. So these are this is where you can add anything that you like. No one else can see it. Um, that is added pretty much anywhere here. So I have like this folder here. This is um, my grad students working on that folder. There's a shared folder. Um, you should see that. And that has any data that has been shared with the community that's kind of protected by admin. And then shared public is one where all of us can share data freely, but everyone can also delete data freely. So the mm -hmm. shared public one is a place where you need to be very careful about what you delete or add or you can add things if you want to share them with the with our community, but please be very careful about only deleting your own stuff out of shared public. Um, everyone's got read write access to that. We can put bigger fonts. Oh yeah. And I'll make this bigger. Yeah, sorry. We're gonna do those. Yes. Oops. Yeah, question? Um, can you remind me what the shared folder space you used for? Shared? Yeah. So this one, this is data that's shared and protected by admins. So admins can write to it um, and it can be shared with the community. So we have some like events that like Q Greenland's gonna have some stuff in there. Um, and so these are files that everyone can access, but y'all don't have the ability to read or write or to write to this. Um, so this is kind of how you navigate um, through those file folders. Um, this is coming from this like folder button here. The next button down tells you the open tab. So I have a terminal window open. Kernel, your kernels are basically what runs your Python or your R. Um, code in the background. So each of the one, you'll have one of these for each of your notebooks or whatever that are open. And then there's one terminal that's open. The dash, uh, the dashboard for Dask is, Dask is a way of parallelizing your code. It's distributed um, coding, uh, computing. We don't have it entirely um, worked out yet because we don't have any users that are doing that. You can use Dask for one computer for like one of your servers, but you will eventually be able to create um, create tasks that use uh, multiple computers and you can monitor the progress here. But the next one below, um, I usually use the command line for opening up and dealing with all of my GitHub stuff, but you can do it in a kind of a GUI here. And just below here, this is um, basically an outline of your notebook. We're not showing a notebook now, but in a moment when we open up the next notebook um, for the tutorial Wilson will do, you'll see that this fills out and you can, you can skip to different parts of that notebook from here. Um, the button over here is um, for advanced, uh, you can you can change the metadata for a notebook there. I've never used that. This I think is going to be our usage um, for the Jupyter Hub. This button that we're creating that will monitor our usage and our costs that hasn't been fully constructed yet. And then this is for debugging, which is a new um, feature in Jupyter. Now, using all of this, you can go into settings and change your themes and your color um, your color schemes and stuff in here in the settings. Um, we're gonna go back to our main area here. When, so I have a terminal window open. I'm gonna close this here over on the side. I have a terminal window open, the plus sign launches a launcher. So that's where all of our buttons are. Um, Console is a place where we open up and can do like scratch kind of work. This opens up a Python notebook, a new one, and you can uh, start typing your code in there. 
if we do another launcher button here, um, the virtual desktop is basically your Linux desktop. And when it opens up, it looks like just like your computer would. Um, QGIS is here. So we open that up. We can open QGreenland from in there. We have our home file system. And what you'll notice is that the um, things that are in here are the same as the file structure that we see in our Jupyter lab over here. So all of these files um, show up just like they would in our computer in here. And there's things like you can search the internet and things like this. This means that you can do kind of seamless work between the um, the cloud, co the computing that you're doing and visualization and any things that any other things that you need. If there's tools that you need that are not on here, we can chat about um, adding those. And then sync thing, as I mentioned before, is like Dropbox. Um, the only thing that's that you the main thing that you have to do with sync thing is you need to choose who you're sharing with, whether it's your local computer or some other person. And so you have to add remote devices to do that. And all of the documentation to um, set all of that up is here. Um, we can open that up and here's the same thing documentation for uh, adding the passwords that you need, adding the remote um, devices, that sort of thing. So all of this is available. Um, there is infrastructure to be able to visualize things like geojsons um, without the actual background um, code that you normally like would look at. So like if I say open with editor, then it'll show this is what your geojson file actually looks like. And we can please. There we go. We can put these side by side. So this is the code. Um, and then we have a GeoJSON visualizer. This is showing the tiles from that GeoJSON file. We can visualize our CSV and um, we can edit it as well if we do it an open with editor. Um, so we can put those side by side if you want to like edit your CSV. You can also visualize it here on the left. Um, you can visualize images really easily. We've got three different windows next to each other. It's getting a little cluttered. Um, but there's lots of versatility in here. And um, yeah, so this is kind of, it, does anyone have any questions? This is, oh, I know what I need to um, leave you with. So. The kernel is the place where you can shut down your kernel, restart it. If you have a kernel that turns off while you're running something, it's probably because you run out of memory and you can just bump up your server um, to be able to um, not have that memory crash. Um, when you do installations, percent pip install within your notebook is how you do those installations. Um, your pip installations are not persistent from one use to the next. And we do that because um, when we share code with each other, we want it to be as replicable as possible. And if the if the pip installs are persistent, then the next person who used your notebook will not have the same environment. Um, if there's something that's really burdensome that you need to pip install and that you think multiple people here will use, let us know and we'll add it to the environment. Because um, we don't want you to have to deal with a ton if there's a ton of stuff that you need to do um, pip installs for. But the um, the right way to do this in your notebook is to put the pip installs at the top of your notebook. So then when you share it, uh, it's all replicated. Um, and the other thing that you need to know is how to shut down your server. So the servers cost money and these are fairly cheap servers, but in order to save money, what you can do is you can go to hub control panel and stop my server. And what that does is turns off your um, server and then you can log off over here in the top right. And that button will disappear once the server is stopped. Yeah. So it's gonna get angry at me now. Um, 
but it's under file and then you go down to hub control panel yeah so now this is this server has been shut down so that's why it's like yelling at me you can no longer use it um you have to restart it you can also in this in this area you can add you can start you can start a new server without actually logging out if you want to just bump up to a larger server um, but for now i'll just log out here um, and then log back in so this is like the original page that i should have seen um and so what that does is it shuts down your server immediately if you aren't using your server the nice thing is that after 90 minutes it'll shut down automatically um if you haven't been using it so don't worry if you like forget about it that's one of the things that's really cool about this infrastructure that you might not have somewhere else is that cost saving tool that shuts shuts off your server um, if you aren't using it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is switch back to the PowerPoint and So a little bit of housekeeping just to finish this off. Um, we have a getting started page for anyone else who needs to have access to this. Um, we want you to keep your personal storage below 50 gigabytes. And if you end up needing more, please come talk to us and we can um, we can we can talk we can talk about it and figure out if if what you need is feasible. So just so you know, in the background, two terabytes of data costs about $90 a month. So everything that we store in there costs a little bit of money. It's here, it's meant for you to be able to use. So like, don't worry about using it, but just be cognizant of how much storage you're using and let us know if, if it's getting to be large. Um, is, that, is that on S3 or is that on the instances SSD? So this is the, this is the instances. So S3 is about half this um, cost to store data. So if it's in an S3 bucket, but our personal storage and our shared file storage, yeah. all of that is a slightly is a is a slightly more costly um, storage, and it allows us to like e all easily access it. Um, we are discussing community S three buckets, so if you need an S three bucket, you're working on a team. Dennis Felixson just created an S three bucket um, that that his team uses, so there's options for you guys scanning those up. Um, as I mentioned, pip installs are not persistent. Um, please use percent pip install. And um, I mentioned the hub, the hub shutdown. So for troubleshooting, um, we have a community to work together to do to answer questions. So places where you can get help is if you need to, you can go to the Slack um, channels that we have and ask questions about the hub. You can report issues like specifically about the technology if there's an error or anything like that with, within um, the GitHub issues. You can go to, uh, for general hub questions and troubleshooting that are not just specifically CryoCloud, you can go to the discourse, um, the Pangeo discourse page. And um, our CryoCloud team will help you with whatever you need. So if you don't know where to go, just ask on um, the Slack channel or CryoCloud um crown the cloud at mines.edu also if you use our cloud we would love it if you would cite us in your papers um we have this Zenodo link here this is our jupiter book Zenodo link but anytime you use crowd cloud and you publish um please add our um citation there and if you have slides, if you have tutorials, things like that, that you want to add, um, you can add to our Zenodo community and we can get a, a DOI for you there as well. Here's uh, the links for everything that we've talked about. Our website, Hub, Jupyter Book, which is where all the tutorials are going to be. Our GitHub is the code location for all of this and our Hub infrastructure, um, our Slack channel, the Pangeo discourse and citing in our, our Zenodo community. Here's some Q Greenland links because um, I went over Q Greenland. So there's documentation and the tutorial for using Q Greenland if you want it. And then if you want more skills beyond that, um, you can go to um, the ISAT2 
uh, data and processing tutorials that are in the ISAT2 Hack Week. They have their own GitHub. Um, for NASA data access, you can go to our book or the NASA OpenScapes cookbook. There's other cookbooks out there um, that you can use. We're probably going to provide some advanced skills tutorials um, for parallelized computing and for other things. Um, I can potentially do a tutorial on sync thing or something like that too. And then definitely participate in the ISAT2 Snow, SnowX Ocean or Cloud Computing Hack Weeks. They're phenomenal for getting a lot of cool up to date, like the, the coolest, newest code out there uh, is developed um, in these hack weeks and you get an entire week to work in the cloud. So with that, well, thank you there. Um, we have an exercise to go through um, before we do our next project, and then we'll have a break. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of data access, it looks like you have like ISAT and remote and like credit score things. For stuff that's being provided by organizations, like in the cloud on like Amazon S3 or something, like and there's special stuff is up there, like now Sina is. Are those sorts of things that you could somehow pipe into from Cloud Cloud, or are they in like separate walled clouds that go onto each other? Yeah, so the question is um, things that are in the cloud and S3 buckets, can we access them? So if they have public access, then yes. Um, basically, everything that NASA has is accessible. There's some Sentinel um, buckets that are available. Uh, yeah, you, you can access them if they're public. Um, and then you can also like read in and access things, even if they're not in the cloud, you can read them into like X-ray and stuff like that with a URL. Any other questions right now? I'm wondering, um, you mentioned cloud computing hack week. Is there, uh, any like cryo focused kind of cloud computing hack week or? So the ISAT2 two one, ISAT2 and SnowX are both cloud computing, um, ones that are focused. Uh, uh, Tasha, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to interject. There is not going to be a SnowX Hack Week this summer. Um, and there is not, uh, I think that was Twyla asking, there is not specifically a cryosphere focused cloud hack week. Um, it will be generically ISAT to cloud hack week uh, for this summer. We'll be sending out some information for people who want to join the organizing team uh, shortly. Cool. Yeah. All right. So for this task, um, I'm going to open up this server option and let Wilson chat through. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Wilson. Um, and yes, I'll walk you through this quick exercise and then we'll have a quick bio break for everyone to get up and grab some coffee and whatnot. Okay. So um, you'll log into CryoCab if you have not already. Oh, yes. Oh, right. Yes. There we go. Okay, we'll get this booted up. And then what we'll be doing is we'll be cloning the repo of the CrowdCloud website because it's got it's where we house all the tutorials. So if you are on a web page, what you can do is just go to cryointhecloud.com. Yes, and then from here, as Tasha mentioned, there is both um, the hub access here that we just logged into, and then there's also uh, the Jupyter book here. Um, so if we go to the Jupyter book, um, I, Tasha mentioned this, so this is where we access a lot of things, but then we can also get to the source code by just clicking on the GitHub logo up here and going to the repository. Okay, so now we're in the repository. Now that we're here, we're just going to click on this blue code, or excuse me, green code button, and then we'll copy the link. And then we'll go back to our hub. And then from here, we'll open up a terminal. Uh, command line. Okay, great. So um, now we can see we're um, in the base. 
uh, environment. So we're just here in our file browser. We're just in the main. If you did want to organize the your GitHub repos, like let's say you've got your own GitHub repos that you want to clone to your directory, you could have a folder for repos. You could have a folder for your own repos versus ones you're contributing to. Um, so you could uh, change directory to a specific folder if you want to organize things a bit. And as you build all of your workflow in here, you'll want to be a bit more organized. But for right now, we're just going to get cloned to um, where we currently are, which is that main folder. So we'll just do git clone, and then we'll paste that URL and click enter. Uh, so I'll take um, a little bit. It's just copying everything that's in there. Uh, the command is git clone, and then that URL from the website. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come over. Yes, please. <laughs> How are folks doing? Perhaps raise your hand if you need a second more. And yeah, this is the task for now. So if you are done, you can take a break.